Uh, my name is Joona Lehtinen. Uh, it's always and again a uh, great honor to be able to host this meetup or conference, whichever you want to call it. And we as again have two meetups or conferences, one here in, in Mountain View and one in, in Munich. Let's take the most important stuff first. <laughs> so uh, it should be pretty easy this time. The Wi-Fi is pretty good and there is no password for it. So we have 212 attendees this year over here in Mountain View and I think it's pretty good. The really interesting thing is that we actually have 436 attendees in Munich. So altogether we have around 650 attendees and that's actually great news because that's two more than last year so we are growing. <laughs> I was really worried the last night when I saw that we are actually going down by five attendees and fortunately there was seven guys registering throughout the night for, for Munich. And I guess we'll still get some registrations, it might go to up to 700 or so. We have an agenda uh, for mobile. Um, that's pretty handy but the most important stuff about it is that you can actually uh, vote for presentations over there, so please do add your votes for each presentation so that we know how the big speakers are uh, performing and we can give them some feedback. Then later on, on Friday, we have a panel. Uh, most of the good steering committee will be in the panel, so it's going to be interesting, but most interesting stuff for you is of course submitting really tough questions, so please ask something really controversial and something that we'll get the guys uh, in an uneasy position when they are trying to answer your questions. So you can go to guidcreate.com and there is a button right below the agenda where you can click and submit more questions for the panel. Please do that and there is also voting for those questions. And of course, please do tweet uh, and use guidcreate hashtag so that we can attract more people to guid ecosystem, so some funny pictures and people will be sharing that around. Tonight, uh, 6.30, we'll have a party, or it's more of a networking event, so we have three hours reserved just for networking, because if you look around, you see the smartest guys in the, in the good ecosystem around, so please network with each other and, and learn. I think that should be the best part of the conference. But the interesting thing is that we are here in, in uh, Computer History Museum, so we have interesting stuff in the museum as well. And the museum will be open for all of you, so if you want to take a tour, I truly would recommend that. So we have a bit old stuff and a bit newer stuff and even more new stuff. And, you know, there are things like grey supercomputers and robots and latest mobile devices. <laughs> and even latest and greatest things on the web. Actually, that leads us to our keynote speaker. So the next latest and greatest things in the web. Uh, please welcome Ray Cromwell for telling us more about those. Try the VGA instead of HDMI. Maybe that will work. Okay. <coughs> okay, so uh, my name is Ray Cromwell. I am an engineer at Google working on GWT. And um, first of all, I'd like to say it's really great to see you guys here. Um, we only get to do this once a year, which is to gather all the people who are in the GWT community together. And um, I really like this conference um, because uh, it's really the only chance we get to t see most of you guys face to face. So I hope you guys uh, enjoy the sessions today and um, hope we get to t I get to talk to a lot of you. So if you were here last year, 
Um, I kind of split the keynote into two parts. One is I looked at this sort of state of the community and what's been happening up until that point in time, and then I talked about what we were going to planning to do for 2014. So I'm kind of going to give a little bit of a State of the Union address here. Obama just gave his, so I'll give mine. And um, let's look at um, what's happened since last year. So uh, last year we um, decided we were going to release the GWT 2.7 version, and um, we figured out a lot of nice things that we could add to that release for you, and so I'll talk about a few of those if you're not familiar with them already. Um, so uh, we have an entirely new incremental compiler that John Stalkup has been working on for the whole entire year, and it's massively faster than the old SuperDev mode in 2.6. Um, I don't even know what the ratio is, but like a typically medium-sized app will compile in like less than two seconds. Um, and so if you're interested in how that works, you should definitely see his session today. Um, We've made really good performance improvements to the SDK. In some cases, um, several hundred percent uh, performance improvement. Um, we've added a totally new way to define uh, CSS in your applications via Google Style Sheets. And um, we started adding uh, experimental support for this new JavaScript interrupt technology, which I have a session on today, and uh, which is used by um, Google Inbox, the new uh, Gmail. So uh, as I mentioned, super dev mode, uh, one thing it does is it basically builds only the classes that's changed, or recompiles only the classes that changed. I don't know what happened there. Uh, the second thing it does is if you haven't changed any classes at all and you just hit refresh, uh, it's instantaneous. So you don't really have to hit the compile bookmark with it anymore. You just hit refresh in the browser and it will either recompile something or it will just reload. Um, and there's been some fixes that have been made to the source maps that are out output by this so that when you're debugging, um, it doesn't really choke Chrome as much as it used to. And as I mentioned, uh, since last year, we've got a lot faster. Here the story is actually pretty good. For example, uh, Joel Weber makes a popular sort of uh, multi-platform benchmark called uh, Bench2D, and it uses the Box2D library, physics library. And so um, I basically added ourselves to the benchmark to see where we stand, and um, I'd say it looks pretty good. We're actually faster than several um, competing platforms and only really two times slower than the JVM itself, the latest JVM. We've also ported the Octane benchmarks, the JavaScript benchmarks, to um, Java, and now we compile them and we run them against the hand-coded JavaScript versions. And you can see we're actually winning now on several uh, benchmarks, Delta Blue, Ray Tracer, significant, uh, and uh, Splay just barely. Um, we need, need to help Richard out a little bit. But um, work is only going on that, and so I think we're going to continue to improve the performance of that. And <clears throat> Gaktug, who's one of the uh, team members, he actually did a lot of performance work on the basic JRE emulation classes last year. Uh, and as a result, um, the hash map class alone has sped up by between 500 to 800% in our benchmarks, which is really important because hash maps basically are heavily used in most programs. In fact, uh, one reason we did the work is because Google Inbox, uh, which uses GWT, was actually showing in profiles that the hotspot was in HashMap. Um, string, uh, the string class has been radically improved. A lot of the basic operations that you might use a lot, like starts with, have been sped up. Um, exception um, handling is now lazy. So it used to be that when you threw an exception and it got caught, it would construct the Java stack trace immediately, which is kind of an expensive procedure, and now it defers it until you actually call get stack trace. Um, or fill in stack trace. And um, the cast operator, the basic cast and instance of operator, which uh, pretty much anytime you fetch anything out of a uh, JRE collection, you've got an implicit cast there if it's generic, um, uh, occurs. And that's been sped up by 200%. And that actually allowed our ray trace benchmark to overtake JavaScript. And so um, we're getting pretty fast now. So then the question is, is how small are we? Because code size still matters, especially on mobile. And there, the story actually is also pretty good. This is Bench2D again, comparing the executable size on disk of um, a couple of platforms. You can see that GWT's actually smaller than a stripped C binary in optimized mode, smaller than hand-coded JS, smaller than uh, compiled action script, which is actually gzipped, uh, smaller than Dart to JS. It's actually the smallest of all of the Bench2D benchmarks that we, we looked at. So our size story is also pretty good. So, <clears throat> Moving on, another great thing happened last year. Java 8 was finally released by Oracle. 
So we now have lambdas. Who's excited about that? I, I think it's been like a decade, but I don't, I don't know when it started, but finally, just finally. And we, there's also some other cool things, which like default interface methods. Now, this is going to be amazing. Why? Because of JavaScript interop. Um, here's an example of how like adding an event listener will look uh, with job eight. So you'll have like, you know, B dot add event listener, click comma, and then like a little arrow function, inline lambda. And um, that's important because JavaScript is fundamentally async. Um, pretty much every browser API is async. I mean, it takes callbacks. Uh, the newest browser APIs that are being added now are all using promises, and promises is all about chaining async callbacks. And so uh, if you were in callback hell before, you're going to be in even worse callback hell in the future. And so if you don't have lambdas, you're going to be pulling your hair. Um, but with lambdas, things are going to be quite pleasurable. So I mentioned GSS support earlier. Um, some of you over the years might have been saying, why doesn't Gwit CSS resource support CSS3 and all the new stuff that's been added to the web since then? One of the reasons why is we were using a parser, I think, from like 1996 or something, from the W3C, that was the flute parser. And so um, no one was willing to update that. Um, and so we decided to rebase our support for style sheets on Google style sheets, which is um, used by the Clojure compiler uh, internally. And basically, it's an extension to CSS3. It adds things like variables, mix-ins, conditions. Um, it's also a compiler, so it can minify, minify CSS. It does lint checking. It does um, internationalization with right-to-left flipping, just like CSS Resource did. And actually, we found that it reduced some of our internal applications by about 1% in code size, just by changing the CSS compiler. And so um, I think you guys are going to enjoy that. There's a session today. I think Julian's giving it. Um, about uh, CSS3, which is all about GSS resource. Okay, another great thing happened last year uh, in October, which was the release of Google Inbox. Now, I had to sit, you can imagine, I had to sit there for like the last two years for people saying, is Gwit dead? And all the time I knew that we were working on this amazing new application, um, a new flagship application for Google that's in fact using JWT. And in fact, um, before Inbox was released, um, Google Sheets was released last year. Uh, that's a new version of Google Docs uh, for the web and for other platforms, and that too uses GWT. This is sort of the second generation of that. And so um, the question is, is why does Inbox even care about GWT? Why, is, why didn't they rewrite Gmail with JavaScript? Well, the problem is, is that in today's world, especially with mobile, um, we don't know where people are going to be using their app the most. In fact, they're probably going to be using it on a mobile device. And um, although the mobile web is getting constantly better and better, when Inbox was started years ago, um, the mobile web actually wasn't very good. And so we had to hedge our bets. We needed a way to develop an application that would let us sort of choose our path later if we wanted to. So we'd have a web application, and we could make native applications out of it as well. And um, GWT actually um, is a really good uh, solution for enabling that um, by using Java as the shared language between the platforms. And so I have a session on that later today. And if you're interested in how that works, um, you can uh, hear more about it. But basically, it introduces a new kind of application that we call hybrid apps. Now, this is kind of an unfortunate naming. Someone at Google suggested calling them thoroughbred apps. Um, but it really, it's not like a phone gap is a hybrid app, not in that sense. It's really a hybrid app in the sense that it's two different languages. Your application's written in two or more languages, and they are compiled together as a single uh, binary. So it's static linkage. And what we found with Google Inbox is actually we're able to share up to 70% of the code between the web, Android, iOS, and even the server, um, which makes developing on multiple platforms really nice. Um, it also lets you use the native tool chain. So if you've got a whole bunch of Xcode ninjas who are iOS programmers, you know, they can really hammer out that like, native UI uh, um, in Objective-C, and then they can just link it with a library that's been transpiled with J2 Objective-C. And so uh, t later on today, there's a J2 Objective-C session. So if you're actually uh, interested in how would you take a Java app that's using code for the web and transpile it into an Objective-C library that can be used for a purely native iOS app, um, you can find how to do that by, from Tom Ball later today. So the Inbox Web actually uses a, um, the technology called JS Interop that we uh, included as experimental in GWT 2.7. Uh, 
And what this basically does is it gives you a new set of annotations for um, telling the compiler that certain methods need to be callable from hand-coded JavaScript or vice versa. And um, previously, um, if you've been doing GWT for a while, you might have used my GWT exporter library. Um, think of this as like the next generation of that because now the compiler is aware of um, what it needs to do to make code exportable. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, essentially, what JS Interop allows you to do is it allows you to have effortlessly um, cross-language uh, um, method calls and variable references as well as um, cross-language type checking even. And we use this a lot on uh, big top, um, sorry, on, I used its code name, on the inbox. Um, for example, uh, you can export a Java class to JavaScript, and in JavaScript, if someone calls you the constructor with the wrong number of arguments or the wrong types, you can actually get a runtime error um, calling from JavaScript to transpile Java code. Not a runtime error, sorry, a, a compile time error, which is really nice. Um, and that's basically how Inbox is built. It uses hand-coded uh, UI written in uh, Clojure or JavaScript, and then that's basically wired up to shared logic that's exported from Java. I mentioned J2 Objective-C earlier. Um, I just want to mention, yes, it really does work. It actually sounds like there's no way it could work. I was actually thinking myself that there's no way this would work, but it actually does. And um, it's, it's quite amazing. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to mention was community involvement. I'm quite pleased to see that we've uh, met or even exceeded our uh, numbers last year. But there's other things to be thankful for. Um, we've seen an increase in the number of patches from non-Googlers. <coughs> there were times over the years where actually the amount of, the amount of uh, commits from Googlers was well over 90-something percent. We weren't getting very many external patches at all. And for an open source project, that's not a, um, a good thing. And since we've introduced this new steering committee process and we've moved to a, a new source code repository and we have a better review system, um, we've seen those patches go up, and in fact, last year, I think 25% of all the commits were patches that originated from external users. So I think I want to give the uh, community a round of applause for that. And I'd like to invite um, all of you to get involved. I think there's some workshops and some sessions here to try to teach you guys how to uh, help us out. Uh, one place, actually, where you could, would be able to help us out a lot is once we flip on Java 8. Um, there's lots of Java 8 uh, emulation classes that we'll be missing. And so if your favorite class that's in Java 8 is missing, you know, you can, you can implement it and submit a patch to us, and maybe we'll make it into the next version of GWT. Um, the other thing is if you look at the agenda today, um, there's a lot of actually innovative, innovative things being done by external community members. Like there's Polymer talks and Web Component talks, and um, uh, I can't even remember all of them, but I see a lot of interesting stuff being done by people um, who are not, you know, on the GWT team itself. And so um, I'm thankful that I see that occurring, and I hope to see a lot more of it. One last thing to be thankful for, of course, is to thank Baden for presenting this conference every year. Um, I hope they continue to do it, and um, it's a great chance for all of us to get together and um, consult on the future of GWT. And so let's give Baden a round of applause. Okay. Uh, the other thing that happened in 2014 is the web got a lot better. You might have seen this slide last year, which basically talks about where GWT was, uh, where the web was when GWT was created in 2006. And uh, the web was in a pretty sorry shape in 2006. And Joel Weber and Bruce, who were the inventors of GWT, are here in the audience today. They're actually going to be giving a very interesting talk on the history of GWT. Not my history of GWT, which I gave, but the history of GWT told from the actual people who created it and why they created it, and some, I guess, of the horror stories and the, the fun stories as it was happening. But long story short, from 2006 to 2014, JavaScript performance has gone up by 2,200%. That's a huge tectonic shift. And also, the browsers have finally, since IE6 and 7 and 8 are dying off, have finally um, started to converge. Here's a list of HTML5 scores over the years, and you can see you know, there used to be quite a big gap, but they're kind of converging now, and I think with IE 11, they're getting, they're getting even closer together. So the web itself is uh, improving and getting more <coughs> coherent. I mentioned history. Um, so last year I talked about uh, mobile. This is for uh, the uh, Game of Thrones fans. 
Um, and I, I mentioned the fact that about 50% of web traffic is now mobile. And uh, it's only going to grow. And mobile native apps have really created this um, expectation that you're going to have a fast, fluid, jank-free experience. And so your users' expectations, if you're doing publicly facing <coughs> web apps, has changed. And you're going to find over the next year or two or more that uh, even for enterprise apps, you know, your boss is going to come to you and he's, he might ask you to write a native app um, or he might ask you to write a mobile web app. But either way, some of you are going to be doing tablet and mobile apps. And so um, GWT has to evolve to meet this modern web. And we did some things last year to do that, but GWT 3 is all about trying to meet those new um, expectations. So JavaScript performance continues to rise. Firefox actually recently eclipsed um, Chrome, so their performance is going way up. Chrome has a new VM called TurboFan that's going to be released soon, which also steps up the bar for performance. Apple released a new JavaScript VM called FTLJIT, which also is very, very fast, and even Microsoft's rewriting their browser from scratch again. And so we're seeing massive amounts of uh, improvements in just the raw performance of JavaScript. But more than that, we're seeing huge improvements in how the browser re uh, renders um, in terms of the, the fluidity of the rendering. And um, if you have some time, go search for Chrome Developer Summit and watch some of the amazing demos that they've shown on mobile devices uh, for mobile Chrome at that summit. You won't believe your eyes. Um, so there's been huge improvements to Chrome, but most people haven't even noticed them yet. Um, there are new APIs like service workers that allow you to make um, mobile apps really fly. I think Alex Russell, the creator of the um, service worker spec, is here today. He's going to be giving a session, I think, right after the keynote on it. Um, it's really interesting technology, and if you're interested in making apps work offline and work just like native apps, I encourage you to go see that. Web components in Polymer are now uh, much more mature. Like The difference between Polymer 0.1 and Polymer 1.0, uh, it's like a totally new thing. It's it, just no comparison. And actually, some of those Chrome developer summit videos I mentioned actually show some Polymer demos, and um, this is quite amazing. Finally, uh, this year, I think in mid-2015, ECMAScript 6 is going to be finalized. Um, I might be wrong on that. I'm not really sure the dates. Somebody could correct me. But um, ECMAScript 6 support is landing in browsers now. If you go to Firefox console or Chrome console, you'll see some of the features that are already in there. So <clears throat> given that context in 2014 and all the improvements that have been happening, what are we going to do in 2015? Well, one thing is, is that we had originally planned for Java 8 to <coughs> excuse me, be a GWT 3.0 feature. But um, the list of things that we want to do uh, is getting quite long. And so I know you guys can't wait to get your hands on Java 8. So one of the things we're kind of doing is like The Hobbit, we're going to split it up uh, into multiple things. And we're talking about doing tentatively a GWT 2.8 release. So GWT 2.8 has Java 8. And these are the features that we're thinking about uh, for the 2.8 release, uh, which includes uh, Java 8 support finalized and shipped. The JS interop phase one stuff moved from being experimental, like it is today, to being actually on and by default and in um, production ready. Um, improvements to debugging in super dev mode. So if you've been using super dev mode, you might um, have discovered that inspecting heap variables uh, and local variables is kind of annoying, especially if they're like complex objects like Java collections. It's not at all like your normal Java debugger like you're used to. And so um, Brian uh, is doing, Sunsky is doing a um, talk today on uh, what's new in super dev mode, and he's going to show off some new cool things that's being added uh, to, to do better debugging of, uh, for heap inspection in super dev mode. Uh, GSS support will go from being uh, an add-on option to actually being the default option for doing CSS in GWT. Um, and we're going to uh, have some more speed improvements. So I think I might be running out of time, so I'm going to uh, speed up. Uh, lambdas, uh, method references, defender methods, that's what's on tap for Java 8. Also some basic JRE support which I think boils down to Java Util functional. There's lots of other Java 8 classes, though, that we probably won't have time. We don't want to hold up the release for that. And so that's where community comes in. If they're willing to help out, that will actually speed up some, getting some of the stuff landed. Um, it's going to require a Java 8 VM for this kind of stuff. And so if you want to be able to compile Java 8 code and on a Java 6 VM, uh, we're going to need some enterprise and community members to take the retro Lambda project 
and uh, back and use that to backport uh, to Java 7 VMs. And so Retro Lambda rewrites Java 8 bytecode into Java 7 bytecode. So take a look at it if you're interested in hacking on that. JS Interop. We're going to finalize the spec. It's been changing a lot over the last years. It was called JS Interface last year. And um, we're going to remove the experimental flagging. It's just going to be there by default for you to use. And we're going to take the uh, standard browser bindings and we're going to put those into a separate Elemental 2.0 project. It won't be actually part of the Grid SDK, so it can actually evolve really fast and keep up with the, the rapidly changing browser APIs. I mentioned the improved debugging. I mentioned GSS on by default uh, with a on-the-fly converter. So if you, your old CSS to, uh, resource um, files can be automatically converted to GSS. <clears throat> we are going to uh, target a 10% faster fully optimized build. Doesn't sound like a lot, but doing that for an optimizing compiler is, is um, pretty good. So if you have like, you know, 60 second compile, you know, um, you'll have a 54 second compile. And uh, we're going to do some uh, collections work again. And so uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but whenever you ever do like an array list.get, there are actually two bounds checks to see if you went over the edge of the array and throw array uh, out of bounds exception. And that actually really hampers uh, both the JavaScript VM optimizations as well as the GWT compiler optimizations. And so there's going to be a new GWT preconditions class that lets you do arg checking with GWT, but allows you to flip a switch when you compile to actually compile those checks out. And so that will basically allow those range checks uh, to be there in, uh, when you're running unit tests or when you're developing, but when you're actually deploying to production, you can just eliminate them. So these are some of the uh, tentative ideas for GWT 3.0. Um, it was always intended to be a breaking release, and by that we mean we might do some things in it in terms of APIs, deprecating things, or <coughs> um, changing things that will make your app not cleanly compile. You might actually have to edit your source code to make it compile with GWT 3.0. Um, that's unfortunate, but as I said, GWT started in 2006. A lot of the things that were added to GWT um, for the browser and the web of 2006 are no longer relevant, and that's a technical debt that's been holding this back, and we need to get rid of some of it. JS Interop Phase 2, so we're, we're adding a lot more stuff to make JavaScript Interop even more idiomatic and easy to use, and so um, I'll be talking about that in a session later today. Elemental 2.0, that's basically the browser bindings to um, all of the browser APIs. It's a new way of a us actually talking to the browser from, uh, from the GWT compiler, which allows us to always be able to talk to the latest um, um, browser APIs. That means you don't have to wait for a new GWT release to get some new API like WebRTC or speed synthesis in the browser or, let's say, service workers. You can always get the latest API whenever you want. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, even faster collections again. And um, I'll get to that in a second. Support for something called Delta JS and service worker out of the box. And uh, maybe even generate idiomatic ECMAScript 6 modules and classes. And so we'll actually make the code generated by the GWT compiler actually look like you wrote it by hand in ECMAScript 6. So which JS interrupt phase 2? Um, eliminate all restrictions of phase 1. So right now we don't allow method overloading. We don't allow var args. We don't allow non-static fields exported. We don't allow non-final fields. It's all currently prohibited. We're going to remove all of those restrictions. Um, we're eliminating J Disney. Sorry, Bruce and Joel. But we're introducing a, uh, a new, something we call JISD 2.0, which is a pure Java syntax for most needs, so you don't really have to write hardly any inline JavaScript anymore. And uh, we're going to have a natural and idiomatic mapping from most JavaScript constructs to JS idioms. So if you want to have an object literal or an array literal, there'll be an efficient way to represent that in Java, and you won't have to roll something up in the JISD method. As I mentioned, Elemental 2.0. It's a new way of building uh, web APIs, and what it does is essentially goes out and fetches the standards documents from the W3C, fetches web IDL um, um, declarations, and extracts documentation from the specification documents, and automatically generates it Java interfaces with inline JavaDoc. Um, so uh, if, if something new is added to the browser, you can immediately update your APIs. This is based on a project called html5index.org by uh, Stefan Halstein, if you're interested. Uh, so you'll never have to write a Disney method again to expose a new browser API. For example, let's say uh, a new push notification API just gets finalized, and it's landed in the latest versions of Chrome and Firefox, and you want to use it. So what do you do? You invoke a build rule and build, rebuild the Elemental 2.0 library. It's going to go to w3c.org, pull down the push API spec. 
<coughs> extract web IDL definitions, extract uh, documentation. Um, and it's going to generate a Java interface uh, and certainly even insert links to tutorials like from HTML5 Rocks. And then when you fire up your uh, IDE, you can just start using the API. You even get like completion. You'll get like documentation popping right up in your IDE. I might show a demo of that in the interop uh, session. Even faster collections, we talking about maybe adding this annotation called at iterate as array. If you actually put that on an iterable and you use a Java 4H loop, the compiler will underneath not generate a iterator loop. It actually will use an integer index loop. And so for something like array list or native JS uh, um, collection types, uh, it's just going to look like you wrote a for loop by hand as optimally as possible. But in Java syntax, actually, you get to use the nice Java for each idiom. idiom. And we're also, this is a potentially really breaking change, is eliminate auto boxing. So if you have a Java collection of like uh, numbers, um, we won't box it with Java lang integer or Java lang double. What we're actually talking about doing is mapping Java lang number subtypes to raw JavaScript numbers, much like we do with strings, how the string type is not boxed by some wrapper class. It's actually Java lang string is mapped directly to JS string. And so <coughs> this will actually prevent certain instances of operations from working properly, but um, when we looked at code, we found almost nobody is doing um, um, switch case statements or if else cascades checking for instance of integer versus instance of double. And so uh, it could be a uh, nice improvement. We're going to have to do more research on that. Okay, faster startup. Hey, Jonas, how am I doing on time? Oh, okay. Maybe I can slow down. What did I think? Uh, I thought I had, I was running short on time. Okay. Faster startup. <coughs> so one of the things is, since mobile is basically taking over the world, is that mobile networks are still slow. I mean, we, yes, we have LTE here. The latency of turning on the radio is still quite high. But in most of the world, actually, they don't have LTE. And it's quite slow, especially in the developing world. And so um, right now, GWT is going to deliver a pretty poor experience for people, um, let's say, in BRIC countries like Brazil. And so um, why not deliver GWT applications like we deliver Chrome updates or Android updates um, where we only ship down a delta patch between two previous versions of your application? Or why go to the network at all if um, you don't need to? So there's two ways we can address this. One is this technology that we use at Google called Delta.js. This is actually used by Inbox. So what, ha what happens is every time we push a new version of Inbox, we do a new build, we push the JS into a, essentially a data store. And the associated name maps and uh, source maps that the compiler used are also pushed. And so the next time you do a compile, the compiler reads the old name maps. And so when it's minifying the identifiers and obfuscating them, it will tend to give the same name it used to give to this previous same variable in the previous build. And that basically means that you can start actually diffing, creating like diff patches between the two comp compilations. And the diffs will be quite small because the, the variables will be mostly in the same order with the same names. And so only the lines of code that you've changed actually will come out of the diff. <clears throat> and so how that works is if you go to Inbox today and you have version like 1.2 in your local cache, it's going to go to the server and it's going to say, give me the latest version of Inbox. And if the server, we originally, let's say we pushed out a new version last night and it's up to version 1.3. So the server will say, well, you don't have the latest version. So we'll compute a diff using the VC diff algorithm. And hopefully that's a small patch, maybe two kilobytes of JavaScript, maybe, maybe 10. But it'd be quite small. And we'll transmit only that patch down to your browser. Then a little bit of bootstrap JS code, much like the no cache JS that we use for GWT, patches the locally cached copy and then proceeds with launch. And so that means that you know, although uh, inbox is quite large, I think it's like three to four megabytes of JavaScript, most of the time when we push out a new release, people's browsers only download like a few kilobytes. And you can imagine that's really worthwhile if you're on a slow network somewhere, like your hotel. <laughs> um, so the other thing is, is that, well, you know, maybe you don't even need to go to the network. Maybe you can launch it offline. You know, I, for example, for, with Inbox, you know, I might want to check my mail and I'm on an airplane. And so, um, this new, new, tech, new technology called service workers is really going to enable these use cases. And so service workers essentially allow you to perform persistent background processing uh, in your browser, which means the browser can pretty much 
um, <clears throat> not have your app loaded, and <coughs> sorry, um, and then a request can be made to get a network, network network resource, and a service worker can wake up and actually try to fulfill that uh, request. Um, it also could potentially, and I think there's going to be future APIs to do this, be woken up by push notifications. And so you can imagine, um, you can send a notification to your app. The user doesn't even have your app open. The service worker wakes up, downloads um, some data, populates the cache, and the next time they launch the app, it's already there. So it's kind of like preemptive loading of your, and updating of your app. And so uh, Alex Russell, who's uh, here today, he's the um, editor of this spec, and he's going to have a presentation to tell you all about the wonderful things that service workers can do. Um, when I saw the service worker spec, I was actually, this is perfect. Because I think GWT applications are a really good fit for the service worker model. Why is that? Because GWT builds applications like C compilers do. You know, we are a globally optimized compiler. The compiler actually has a view into all of the resources that your app uses. Not just the, the code, but it knows about images and knows about CSS and other assets. And what this allows us to do is that for most cases, not all, but most cases, it would allow you to um, automatically generate the service worker um, code um, without having to write it by hand. Because the compiler knows what, uh, has, what resources can be downloaded, how they can be patched and updated, and so that can all be taken care of for you. So the potential is there for this to be uh, an out-of-the-box thing where you don't have to do anything and you automatically get an offline app. Moreover, we could combine the two approaches that I just discussed of sending down deltas and service worker eventually. And so, for example, we push out a new version of Google Inbox. There's a small three kilobyte delta to the JavaScript. Some other user on a slow network, he might not even have um, Inbox open. He gets a push notification. It wakes up the service worker. The service worker fetches the patch modifies the local cache, and then the next time he's walking around, he launches Inbox, he's already got the latest version. He didn't have to do anything. He didn't even have to go to the network. Um, and I think that's going to be an awesome experience, um, <clears throat> especially for mobile. And so um, the other thing I mentioned was uh, ECMAScript 6 support. So ECMAScript 6 actually finally adds native sets and maps to JavaScript. And so we're going to leverage that with the Java uh, maps and sets, and that's actually going to give us a performance boost. Uh, believe it or not, so even faster collections again. Um, and we're also thinking about uh, using ECMAScript 6 class declarations. So ECMAScript 6 adds actually um, syntactic sugar for declaring JavaScript classes uh, and modules. And so we're thinking about making the Grid compiler actually write out um, idiomatic ECMAScript 6 um, classes and modules, <coughs> which should make interop um, even more interesting. Um, so, with that in mind, uh, one thing that's not in GWT 3.0, but, but I think which is uh, pretty important, and uh, I'd like to talk about that, is um, radically improving productivity. And so, um, we can do all the stuff we want to to the GWT compiler and to uh, interop and these other things, but it's not going to change the fundamental pain of the way people develop GWT applications today with uh, Java um, GWT widgets and with UI binder and things like that. And you've probably had people in your organization and your enterprise come to you and say, why are you using GWT? Why aren't you using Angular or some other new hotness, right? I'm pretty sure a couple of you have basically had people pressuring to switch to Angular. So the question is, is you know, can we kind of get that experience of Angular development in GWT? And so um, Daniel Kirka, who's uh, the author of MGWIT and a member of the GWIT team. He's presenting something tomorrow called Singular. It's a nice play on words. And what Singular is, is it's basically the Angular model in Java. It's not AngularJS, it's not the Angular APIs, but it's the Angular development model, the, the whole way the experience works in Java. Uh, and it's got some differences between Angular. Uh, first of all, there's no dirty checking, so you don't do state diffing to try to figure out what objects have changed and what needs to be re-rendered, because we are a compile time framework, and so um, we can do this more efficiently. There's no additional DOM, uh, initial DOM walk, and so one of the things some, a lot of these frameworks do is they parse the whole DOM tree, looking for magical attributes in the DOM, and then they wire up controllers and other things. That actually um, really adds to the latency of the startup of the app, and we don't need to do that, because we parse the templates at compile time. So this is going to scale to big applications and run pretty efficiently on mobile. 
and it's going to be smaller as well. And like I said, because we don't do dirty checking and we, we actually generate the data binding code efficiently, um, it's going to be faster. And so I'm not going to actually show you any of Singular. Um, I encourage you to see Daniel's talk tomorrow because there is something else that Singular can do that is a secret and you'll find out in the session. So in conclusion, there's lots to be excited about. Um, draft compilation is fast at last. Uh, how many people are, are not using super dev mode yet? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. And so you, um, if you haven't checked it out recently, you really need to check it out now because um, it's pretty fast. Just to give an example, um, uh, Google Inbox compiles in less than three seconds. And um, that's a quite substantial app. Typical apps um, that are smaller than Inbox probably will compile in two seconds or less. And it really depends on how many classes you change because it's proportional to the number of classes you change. Um, you're going to have CSS3 support out of the box. Um, Lambda and method references, finally. JRE collection classes that have little to no performance tax. So if you've had an application before and you're like, uh, I'm going to go use an elemental collection or I'm going to hand roll some JavaScript um, Disney methods to deal with this because of performance, you no longer have to worry about that. Um, super demo debugging is getting better not just in the browser, but also with IDE integration. So IntelliJ, uh, JetBrains has a session here, and they're going to show you some stuff about how you can do um, Java-like debugging inside of uh, the IDE directly with super dev mode. And I don't know, but maybe somebody will show the Eclipse version of that as well. Maybe James Nelson. I don't know. Somebody, somebody who uses Eclipse might, might be able to show that. Um, so. We're also going to introduce a radically simplified uh, JavaScript interop. And so if you've seen what I announced last year and what I've talked about, it's actually um, going to get a lot better, uh, a lot simpler. And I think you're really going to like some of the stuff that uh, we're proposing. Um, we're enabling a new type of cross-platform hybrid application with some of this stuff. And so um, if you guys do need to potentially support native apps, um, we allow you to defer that decision. So you can go develop your app um, write all your Java code, and you don't have to worry about having to become an Objective-C programmer. And if your boss comes to you and he says, well, look, I don't want a web app. I really, really need a native app. All of a sudden, you can use 70% of your code. You still sh share your code with the web using GWT, and then you can use J2 Objective-C, which is also a Google product, and that will allow you to get native performance on native apps. And finally, um, the web has gotten a lot better. I encourage you to check out the web components and Polymer stuff in the Chrome Dev Summit videos on YouTube. Service workers, really interesting stuff. You should look at it. And um, mobile web is getting a lot faster. Those are really good, th good things to be excited about this year. I feel the web is making a comeback, and GWT can be a part of that. So that's my presentation for today. Um, thanks for coming, and uh, enjoy the conference. <laughs>